What's one of the most important secrets to success with long-term weight loss? Managing your hunger. That's right, something as simple as hunger can completely sabotage the best efforts and the best detailed plan for weight loss. And we've seen it time and time again with recommendations for counter calories, exercise more, low fat meals, basically a program specifically designed to increase hunger. I mean, it, it, that wasn't the intention, but that was the result, that it, a program with recommendations as simple as that increases hunger, and that causes most people to fail with long-term weight loss. So focusing on hunger is so important, and there's been lots of attention to certain hormones that deal with hunger, whether it's leptin or ghrelin or CCK, and there's also been attention to the macronutrient content of your meals. Higher protein, higher fiber tends to decrease hunger. So it's finding the right combination of these, these components that can help you decrease your hunger to help with long-term success with weight loss. And that's one of the benefits of low-carbon keto diets and higher protein diets that they address hunger. But what if one of the most impactful parts of regulating hunger has been right in front of our eyes and we haven't really paid enough attention to it. Something as simple as blood sugar, blood glucose, but because we don't regularly measure blood glucose after eating, it's sort of gone undetected. Well, now we've got a study to direct us to the importance of rises and falls in blood sugar with meals and how that impacts our hunger and our appetite. I'm Dr. Brett Scher, the medical director at dietdoctor.com, and I really want to get into this study because I find this a fascinating study. And sort of like I said in the intro, it's kind of been in plain sight. Glucose is such a ubiquitously measured marker and looked at so often, but we haven't been looking at it quite in this way. But now with CGM technology, continuous glucose monitors, which I just wrote a, a guide on at dietdoctor.com. And now with this new article, I need to update the guide because this is great, uh, great contribution to the literature. But now with CGMs, we have much greater ability to monitor glucose before and after eating for one hour, two hours, three hours, uh, which gives us this kind of data. So let's get into the study. It was done in the UK predominantly, but also with the US cohort. There were 1,100 healthy adults. So this is important. Nobody with type 2 diabetes, presumably nobody with metabolic syndrome or insulin resistance. So healthy adults. So that's one caveat. Um, and they were followed for two weeks at home. So this was meant to be sort of a real world experiment. They're followed for two weeks at home with a continuous glucose monitor. They were given one of five different standard breakfasts. Okay. And this sort of rotated um, throughout the two weeks, what standard breakfast they had. And then the rest of the day, it was up to them what they chose to eat and how much they chose to eat. So after they had the standard breakfast, they were supposed to fast for three hours. And then the study was, okay, how long does it take for you to eat your next meal? How hungry are you? How much food do you eat at that next meal and over the course of the day? And they wanted to see which of the meals and which pattern of glucose response had the biggest impact. So to, to skip the conclusion, what they found was the glucose dip at two to three hours was the most predictive factor for how hungry you were, how early you ate, and how much you ate. So it wasn't the glucose rise necessarily. It was a glucose dip at two to three hours, which is so interesting because people have been saying that for a while, that if you get these big spikes and dips, you get the, you know, quote unquote, hangry more, um, you're going to be hungrier, you're going to crave food because your blood sugar is going down. But we haven't really had the scientific data to support that. But now this study is, is probably the biggest study to look at this and shows pretty, pretty suggestive evidence that that is indeed the case, that it's that dip. So those who had the lowest dip, or I guess you could say the biggest dip um, in their glucose at two to three hours, ate 312 calories more they had a 9% increase in their hunger, and they ate 25 minutes earlier for their next meal. Now, 300 calories a day over you know, weeks and months certainly adds up. 9% increase in hunger doesn't sound dramatic, but anything that increases your hunger, as, you, as the study shows, increases your caloric intake and makes you want to eat more often. So it gives you more time of your insulin and glucose going up and down and less time of it to get back to the basal level. So these are important factors. But now here's the other important thing about this study, which meals had the biggest impact. So first, let's define the meals. The high carb meal had 95 grams of carb in one meal. 
but the high fat meal still had 28 grams of carbs, again, in one meal. So not exactly a, a high fat, low carb meal because still 30 grams of carb in the one meal. The high fiber had 95 grams of carbs again with 17 grams of fiber. The high protein meal still had 71 grams of carbs, but 41 grams of protein. So 41 grams of protein in one meal is pretty good, but still 71 grams of carb in that meal. So it's really a high carb, high protein meal. And then they had a, a, a meal that which they called the oral glucose tolerance test, which was the fewest calories. All the other meals were matched for calories at about 500. The glucose tolerance test was only 300, but had the most sugar for sure at 74 grams of sugar and the highest glycemic index at 100. That's a lot of statistics, but the point being, um, this wasn't a low carb study, right? So even the high protein and the high fat diets, um, although maybe lower carb than the high carb, still pretty high carb. Well, what they found was the diet that caused the biggest glucose dip at two to three hours was oral glucose tolerance test, which was not a surprise because the highest glycemic index, the highest sugar, and they had 9% increase in hunger, whereas all the other had a, a, an actual decrease in hunger. And I'll go over those. So that was you know the meal that I hope no one's eating, right? That's the glucose tolerance test meal that had the highest sugar. Now the high protein meal had the lowest glucose dip at two to three hours, which was only a 4% dip. They also had the great, uh, one of the greatest changes in hunger at a decrease of 16, whereas the high fiber had a decrease of 18. So pretty close between those two. And then for energy intake for the next meal, they were also the lowest, both the high protein and the high fiber had the lowest intake at the next meal. Now I have a hard time even, even talking about the high fat meal because this was a high carb, high fat meal but that had the biggest dip in glucose second to the glucose tolerance test. I guess you could say the least improvement in hunger. The hunger still went down, but it went down by 10 compared to 16 or 18 for the high protein and high fiber. And the caloric intake was a little bit higher. So now we're getting into some of the, the weedy details, but the point being one, obviously high sugar is bad because it's going to cause glucose spikes and drops, but CGM is a powerful tool for monitoring glucose dips after meals, which can then predict hunger and energy intake. For me, that's the most important take home. Because the meals weren't exactly clean as I would call them, I think it's important to, to, to the main takeaway is that CGM can be a powerful tool to help you learn what is causing your blood sugar to dip the most at two to three hours. And then that can then predict energy intake uh, and hunger subsequent rest of the day. And of course, the take home we see time and time again, higher protein, higher fiber reduces hunger, especially when it's a relatively high carb meal. So I thought this was a fascinating study. I hope my my enthusiasm is showing and I hope you can see that why I find it so interesting. And most importantly, I hope you can see how this can apply to you. Um, one more reason why a tool like a CGM can be really helpful and to help you overcome what is probably the most important factor in long-term healthy weight loss, helping you get control over, predict, and overcome your hunger. Because any diet, any lifestyle intervention that does not address hunger is not going to succeed long-term. All right. If you found this helpful, please click the thumbs up and the subscribe button down below and make sure to join us here again on uh, Diet Doctor News on YouTube. And if you're interested in you know, meal plans that have higher protein, uh, recipes that have higher protein that can help reduce hunger as this study shows, we are developing more and more of those all the time and already have well over 100 recipes uh, that are considered higher protein recipes at dietdoctor.com. So hop over there and check it out. Thanks a lot, everybody. Have a great day.